So this presentation, uh, I named Sprint the Hurdles because um, I made the presentation kind of like about what I wish I had uh, in a hurdle coach whenever I was a hurdler because even though I had, you know, my dad was a legendary coach, built a great program, I ran for a dynasty, you know, he wasn't a hurdle coach and his only assistant coach was a throws coach. And so, you know how simple my dad is if you heard him talk, and, you know, he tells long jumpers, just run fast and jump high, you'll be fine. You know, he told me, like, I don't know, learn the hurdles, you'll be fine. Which was great for my development as, you know, getting hurdle knowledge and I really um, benefit from that today as a hurdle coach. But if you've ever heard them before, um, you probably know how frustrating it can be when you've got some issues going on and you don't quite know how to pinpoint what is going on and why uh, it doesn't feel right. And uh, that's really the main reason why I became a hurdle coach. You know, a lot of times people become coaches because of positive experiences in their athletic career. And I had a lot. You know, I loved you know, running for my dad. It was a great experience. But actually, um, my main motivation was like, how awesome would it be for me to become the guy that I wish I had in high school? And so, hopefully, this presentation will give you the tools to be what you know every hurdler I think needs, whether you have experience or not in the hurdles. Most hurdle coaches don't. It's just something that they learn to kind of fill a need on your coaching staff. And I think hopefully I can simplify things enough today to give you the tools. To do so and kind of know what to look for and you know how to be there for your hurdler really so um, I kind of broke this down into here we go kind of broke this presentation down into just a couple philosophical things I know we've talked a lot of big picture stuff with coach O'Malley and my dad about um, feed the cats philosophies and stuff and of course I follow the feed the cats philosophy extensively with the hurdles and we'll talk a little bit about how to incorporate that into hurdle training because it can be a little bit difficult at times um, and then it'll be more technical later in the presentation more about you know uh, the technique of hurdling and things like that which is my favorite thing to talk about so um, I think the most important thing uh, for especially a new hurdle coach is to know like what exactly your role is as a hurdle coach um, you know, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis to be a good hurdle coach? And the first thing is to build confidence. And the most important thing, I think, to build confidence is to not overcoach, because it's easy to find, you know, like, this is how your arm should be, this is how your trail leg should look, this is how your, this and that, and I'm going to go over all that stuff today. And after today, you might say, like, wow, my hurdler has a lot of these things that they're doing wrong. I need to fix all of them. And you might need to. But there are also some things where you can kind of like, as long as it's like not affecting their race, maybe like leave it alone. Um, and not nitpick your hurdler into making them think that something is wrong because I think confident hurdlers are fast hurdlers. Um, now on the flip side of that is um, the diagnosis of the problem. And I think, I don't know who it was, I think it was um, Coach CC. he was talking about um, when your athletes feel like something's wrong and they want to come to you and, and you know ask you what's going on what are you seeing you know that's obviously when you want to step in and help them say like here's what I'm seeing and here's what we can do to fix it um, and the biggest thing is when you're diagnosing those problems is determining what the effect is and what the cause is usually you're going to see the effect of you know what happens after the cause so for example if you know somebody is struggling at the end of a 110 hurdle race you know now what's the cause of that is it the cause that they're out of shape or is the cause that they're losing momentum over the hurdle due to technique issues and then finding those technique issues and the best way i think to do that is to um, use video evidence i i videotape every single rep in my hurdle practices um, i don't usually keep uh, a lot of those videos after practice i'll probably just delete them just to keep space on my iPhone, I just use the normal camera app. I used to use Huddle Technique because you could go frame by frame and actually get some FAT timing on reps from you know start to touchdown and things like that. But that app kind of, I think it got deleted or something. Um, but so now I just use like the slow-mo video or the normal video app on the iPhone, it all works. Um, and then uh, one of my main don'ts, if maybe the only don't 
um, when I talk to hurdle coaches is don't get too dependent on drills and beware of most of it because hurdling is kind of a violent act, right? There's a lot of moving parts and the landing off of a hurdle can take a big toll on the body of a hurdler. Um, hurdlers tend to pile up injuries pretty quick if you give them too much volume and the volume tends to come from drills. Um, in college, I ran for a kind of prestigious but high volume program and it was the first time I actually had a hurdle coach. I was really excited until I learned that we were going to do a two mile warm up jog before practice and then after that we were going to run 96 hurdles as part of our warm up. And then we're going to have hurdle practice. We literally did like 12 sets of eight hurdles as part of our um, warm up. And it didn't take too long for me to develop shin splints and the soft tissue injuries and things like that. So um, I've never been a fan of drills mainly because I think you can get everything you need as far as you know fixing form and technique through low impact drills that I'll talk about later and just doing high speed, full speed, uh, max effort reps. Um, and then you're going to need to find the minimum effective dose, which is a big uh, feed the cats term, minimum effective dose, which is if you went to my dad's presentation last night when he talks about the uh, point of diminishing return, um, you know, what's the least amount that you need, you know, before you start getting that point of diminishing return. And a lot of that's going to come from trial and error. You have to, like they talked about last night, feel uncomfortable with how little you're doing at times. And with me, it was definitely, I got helped finding that minimum effective dose when I was coaching hurdlers that, you know, had some injuries they were trying to just work through, trying to get through the end of the season. I had a hurdler pull his hamstring in late April, and we are just trying to get him to the state meet, and we basically uh, had him jump over just his trail leg within the 300 hurdles, and he only practiced hurdles like three times. And, did one hurdle per rep and only three reps in the day. So it was, you know, through that necessity, I was able to find that minimum effective dose. And hopefully you guys can find that without the necessity part. Um, and then lastly, facilitate success. I'm going to talk about things you can do within a practice to, you know, fix a hurdler's issues when they can't fix it themselves after just telling them, hey, you're doing this, you need to do that. It's sometimes hard to put that into action. And you might need to do something to facil facilitate that growth. So um, I came up with a set of rules. Um, first one, first two actually kind of goes together. We always spiked up and we always go max effort in practice. Um, any, any hurdle practice, we are doing at least three full speed reps um, <coughs> over hurdles. And then um, the two hurdle rule is something that I kind of came up with. Um, when determining, you know, how many hurdles are we going to jump over today, and how many reps of that are we going to do, um, trying to justify why we would do, ever do three or four hurdles in a rep, I'm like, well, why can't we just do two? Because there's nothing that you're getting in the third hurdle or fourth hurdle that you can't work on at least in the second hurdle, right? So I want to work the approach to the first and in between the first and second, and really that encompasses everything you need, and. It's a little uncomfortable, especially when you have a hurdler that's like struggling to three-step at the end, or maybe they're getting beat at the end of the race, because it's like, I need to get them to be able to do that for longer, longer periods of time. And I promise you that's not the issue. The issue is happening with their technique, and we're going to see that here later. Um, and then my last rule is we always discount. Um, I coached the state record holder in Illinois um, in the 110s. He went 1359. He was just amazing. Um, and in an interview with Miles Split, they asked him, like, what do you do in practice? You know, what do you attribute all this success to? And he's like, well, uh, I never jump race height, and I never hurdle race distance in practice. And everyone's like, what? You know, everyone thought that was crazy. And um, it's not as crazy as it sounds, and um, we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. So first of all, more about the two hurdle rule. So um, correct form creates momentum and strong finishes. So the, that's probably the number one question I get from hurdle coaches is why is my hurdler dying at the end of the race, whether that's 110s or 300s. And first of all, anybody on a track team that's dying at the end of the 110s is not, not in shape enough to finish a 110 meter race, right? Um, that's not the issue. And actually the same is true for the 300s for the most part. You might have a little bit of die out, but 
any getting in shape or conditioning work, I, you know, sprint endurance work, lactate work that you get from coaching sprinters, that's enough for hurdlers. You don't need to do any extra conditioning work to finish the 110s or the 300s, surprisingly. Um, a poor finish is that effect that we talked about. The cause is the loss of momentum through improper technique, spacing from takeoff, things like that, that again, I'm gonna talk about in the latter half of this presentation when we go over um, technique. So the cause happens or can be fixed within the first two hurdles. That's really the definition of the two hurdles. So if you had a problem over hurdle number six, that's not a hurdle number six problem, that's just a general technique problem that can be worked on with two hurdles in a practice rep. And now you're gonna get much higher quality within those reps and you're going to get higher quality in the next rep too because you're not going to be dead. You know, you're going to be, even with a five minute um, recovery between reps, if you're doing five, six hurdles in a rep, it's going to be hard to repl replicate um, good performance at the next one. So a little more about discounting. Um, if you don't know about discounting, it's basically defined by shortening the height and or shortening the distance of the hurdles. Um, and we never do race height and we never do race distance and I do talk in absolutes when it's not quite absolute because like I said building confidence is my first priority and I have had a lot of hurdlers that were like not quite sold on my philosophies and coaching techniques and stuff like that and they were like coach can I please just go over a race height hurdle you know before I get to the first meet I'm like all right I'm not gonna you know say my way or the highway or anything like that I'll, I want you to have confidence but then I'll cringe because they'll go and then they'll sky over it and their form will totally change. So I would rather form habits at the height that they can have success. That's that facilitating success thing. And then usually when the hurdlers buy in and they get to a meet, there's really no difference because they've you know formed those habits at the lower notches and shorter distance. And you can discount for uh, many different things. For one, I think anytime you're introducing somebody to the hurdles for the first time, you should go as low and as close as you can to start. Um, just get them used to taking off, jumping off one foot, landing on one foot is very difficult for you know a first timer. Um, and then you can adjust and lengthen the hurdles and raise the hurdles up. Like I will do mini hurdles, you know, six inch mini hurdles to start, where I know that there is really no issue getting over the, that height. Um, but I don't want the hurdler to worry about the height of what they're doing. I want them to get their takeoff and landing right. I want them to get their steps right um, first and foremost. And then we'll graduate them to the lowest notch and then raise them up. Yeah. Do you discount for the 110s and the 300s as well? I was going to say that, but no, I don't do 300s, and I'm going to explain why in like three slides. Gotcha. Um, so uh, other reasons why to discount or how much you would discount would be the weather, like if it's like borderline, I shouldn't even be outside today, it's so freaking cold and terrible, maybe I'll discount a little bit more. So that's part of the facilitating success thing. Um, how many of you guys were hurdlers at one point? Okay, so some of us, and you guys can maybe attest to this too. There's something about hurdling that I've never felt before in any, I played three sports in high school, four sports in middle school. Um, there's nothing like hurdling in practice because it always feels slower. If you put race height, race distance in practice, you can take my state record holder and he will look as slow as me. I'm like, ooh, I don't like the look of that. You know? So that's why I discount, you know, just to make them feel that race pace, performance pace that I, you know, I want them to build habits on. Um, and then, you know, stuff like daily focus, you know, and I think the focus can be different for each individual, somebody learning the cut step for the first time or someone just working on being more aggressive, I might shorten the discount even more. Somebody that's more about just you know maintaining and developing you know consistency, I might keep it a little closer to race distance. Um, and so it's just about you know adjusting for each hurdler based on what they need.